All right, welcome everyone to today's A16Z Crypto Research Seminar. Uh, very happy to introduce Andrew Lewis Pye, a professor at London School of Economics, uh, who will be visiting um, all month. Uh, Andy actually got his start as a computability theorist, believe it or not, but very luckily for sort of Web3 in the blockchains world, he's gotten obsessed with um, consensus for blockchain protocols. We just want to tell us about today, so. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so yeah, actually, I'm gonna talk about a joint project with Tim. Um, which is aimed at the developing of a, a general framework for the analysis of permissionless consensus protocols, right? Be they proof of work, proof of stake, proof of space, or whatever. Uh, so in the talk, I'm going to sort of keep things at quite a high level. So if you're, if you're interested in the details, then obviously I encourage you to check out the actual paper, which has the same title, so it's permissionless consensus, and you can find that in the archive. Okay. What's the story with all the hands? <laughs> Your title slide. Your title slide. The that's bathroom. the hands, that's, right. that's people voting. That's what they're doing. Okay. Oh, it's yeah. voting. Okay. 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 So yeah, starting at the beginning, so um, <clears throat> I guess the most basic question is, so why do we need a general framework? Uh, and the basic answer there is, uh, so obviously, you know, uh, impossibility results play a, a crucial role in building any well-developed theory, and you need a formal framework in order to prove impossibility results. So for the permission setting, we've got lots of uh, good examples of that, right? There are lots of important impossibility results in the permission setting. Uh, so the permission setting is just the classical setting uh, that people have been studying consensus protocols in since the 1980s, right? It just means you have a, a fixed set of known participants, okay? So yeah, in the permission setting, we have uh, a lot of uh, good examples of important uh, impossibility results and results that have significant impact on the way that people go about uh, designing protocols. So the, the FLP theorem is a good example there. So we have this um, it's nice theorem by Fisher, Lynch, and Paterson which says that consensus protocols can't be deterministic if they're going to operate in what we call the, the asynchronous setting, okay, whatever that is. Okay. So we see that impacts uh, the way we go about designing protocols, because if, if we want to design a protocol that's going to work in the asynchronous setting, then we know some randomness is required. Okay, so that's, that's one example, but there are many more examples I could give you. So for the permissionless setting though, okay, so some previous frameworks suffice to model proof of work protocols, uh, but not to develop a general theory. So why do I say that? Well, so in particular, we're going to see various results today which can't be expressed, can't be explained in the previous frameworks, okay? And basically, the issue is that the uh, that, so previous frameworks don't have the right language for talking about uh, consensus protocols that use what we'll call some on-chain resources, these resources like stake. Okay, so one of the things we want to do is to define uh, the permissionless setting, right? We want to map out the space of permissionless protocols. Uh, a sort of point of uh, complexity there is that people often think of some protocols as being like, more permissionless than others, right? So in particular, people often think of uh, like proof of work protocols as being, like, in some sense, more permissionless than uh, proof of state protocols, right? So is there uh, some way we can make that precise? Uh, so what we'll actually do is we'll define a hierarchy of four different settings, right? From uh, like most permissionless, if you like, down to least permissionless, okay? Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll describe those setting, the settings kind of, uh, at a high level now, and we'll define them more precisely later on. Okay, so starting off with the, uh, the, the most permissionless setting, which we call the fully permissionless setting. Okay. Uh, so the basic idea here is that each moment in time, the protocol has no knowledge at all about which nodes are currently running it. Okay, so proof of work protocols like Bitcoin are typically interpreted as operating in this setting. Okay, of course, in reality, you might have some idea about who the players are, but the point is that, you know, technically speaking, that's not required for the, pro for the protocol to operate uh, effectively, right? And as I say, so like, uh, so Bitcoin will operate in the, in the fully permissionless setting. And then we consider like a, a slight relaxation of the fully permissionless setting, uh, which you call the dynamically available setting. Okay, the, the thing to have in mind here is longest chain proof of state protocols, okay? So now, uh, I think there's a difference now each moment in time, the protocol is aware of a dynamically evolving list of IDs. Okay, so the thing to have in mind here, as I say, is like it's like a longest chain proof of state protocol. Think about the, uh, the confirmed transactions and what they, who, the, who those, those transactions say has some stake or stake in escrow. Right? Okay, so now the protocol is aware of a dynamically evolving list of IDs. Importantly, though, so the, the evolution of this, this dynamically evolving list of IDs could be like a function of the protocol execution. And it could also be the case that different players have like, different ideas about what this list is, because right? different people might have seen different versions of the blockchain. Okay, so now we have this dynamically evolving list of IDs, and if we're in the dynamically available setting, we're gonna allow, uh, we, we can assume that at least some uh, honest members of that list of IDs are gonna be turning up and, and carry out the protocol. Yeah. 
Again, you might also assume you know, some bound on the you know, most of row fraction of those being Byzantine, that sort of thing. Okay. Okay, uh, so as I say, so proof of state, longest chain protocols like Ouroboros or Snow White, they normally thought of as operating, they should be thought of as operating in this setting. Okay, and then we have a, a further relaxation, which we're going to call the, the quasi permissionless setting. So in the quasi permissionless setting, again, we have this evolving list of IDs. Okay. But now, uh, membership of the list of IDs is a sufficient condition for membership, for, for participation in the protocol, at least if you're honest. Okay, so now we're going to assume that everybody in that list of IDs is turning up. And participating in the protocol. Okay, if you think about it, so, uh, so BFT style proof of stake protocols like Algorand or proof of stake implementations of, of uh, Tendermint or whatever, they operate in this setting, right? They require all of the, uh, the relevant list of participants to turn up and participate, otherwise, uh, liveness will be violated. Okay, so proof of stake, that's a BFT style proof of stake protocols operate in this setting. But then there are also a whole bunch of proof of work protocols, uh, such as hybrid Belize, um, hybrid Bitcoin, Solida. They all operate in this setting as well. Uh, so we'll talk about them a bit more later on. There's also uh, there's a number of papers in the sort of more uh, the classical literature on what are called uh, player rec reconfiguration protocols, and these are basically like, sort of protocols which are like permission protocols, but now you're allowed changing sets of players. And actually, so proof of stake protocols can really be seen as like a particular form of player reconfiguration protocols. Okay, and so player rec rec reconfiguration protocols are also seen as should be seen as operating in the, in the, in the QP setting, the quasi permissionless setting. You should have already said this. Maybe it's worth reiterating. I mean, the key thing about BFT style protocols is they they vote, and so if you're taking a vote, you need to know what constitutes a quorum, and so that makes it particularly natural to assume that like, okay, I guess we need people to show up if we're going to get a quorum. Right? Exactly right. So you've got a certain number of people voting, and you need to know what that number is, that so you know what, what two thirds of that number is, or, or whatever. Yeah. Okay, so we've got the, the QP setting, uh, and then I'm kind of presuming that people may be familiar already with the permission setting. So this is just the sort of classical setting. We have a fixed set of known participants, okay? And also in the permission setting, we, we generally assume that all participants are always active. Okay, so as I said, so this is a hierarchy going from sort of the harshest setting down to the, the easiest setting. As we go down the hierarchy, you're allowed to make more assumptions. Okay, so that means if we prove any impossibility result for any level of the setting, any, any level of the hierarchy here, then that impossibility result will automatically hold for all higher levels of the hierarchy. Right? So if we, if we prove an impossibility result for the dynamically available protocols, that will automatically hold for fully permissionless protocols. OK, so here we're defining like a hierarchy of settings rather than a hierarchy of protocols. But then what we'll do is we'll, we'll allocate a protocol to the harshest setting in which it's, it's live and consistent or which it performs the required functionality. OK, so we'll refer to Bitcoin as a fully permissionless protocol, for example, because right? it operates in the harshest possible setting. Okay, and then there's a, a bunch of other stuff we've got to do to fully define the framework. It's not just about defining the hierarchy of settings, right? There's lots of other stuff we have to do. But once we've formally defined the framework, then we can go about defining general impossibility results. Yeah. Uh, question on the previous slide. Are you considering like a specific type of network model? Um, and, and or is it the case that you can have a protocol that's like say quasi permissionless in one network model and like fully dynamic in another network model and so on? Uh, if you mean by network, you mean literally who is connected to who, who communicate with who. Okay, no, you're right. So no, we're going to consider like synchronous setting, partially synchronous setting, uh, the async. Well, we won't talk about the asynchronous setting today. But you're right. So which, whether you operate in the, the DA setting or the QP setting might also depend on your synchronicity setting, like, like, like with Ethereum. Oh, yeah. Okay, so once we've, we've defined the framework, we can prove general impossibility results. Okay, uh, and one of the things we're going to be interested in doing in particular is sort of delineating what becomes different, uh, what possible in different levels of the hierarchy. So here are uh, sort of a couple of taster theorems for you now, in case you're impatient. So there'll, there'll be some more theorems later on, and there are more, more theorems in the paper, OK? So the first theorem here says that protocol solving consensus in the fully permissionless setting cannot be deterministic. OK, and that holds even in synchrony. OK, so you have the FLP theorem, but that's for a much harsher setting in some sense in terms of communication as the asynchronous setting. This, this holds even in synchrony. OK, so you can sort of see that as an analog of the FLP theorem in a sense, if you like. Okay, that's one theorem that we'll see later. And then a second theorem here says that dynamically available protocols can't solve consensus in the partial synchrony model. So I haven't defined the partial synchrony model yet, but you should have in mind, this is just like a standard uh, setting in which most of the well-known sort of, uh, permission protocols operate. So protocol, pro pro protocols like PBFT, Hot Stuff, um, Tendermint, and so on, they all operate in the partial synchrony model. Okay, so dynamically available protocols can't solve consensus in, the, in this, this fairly standard model. Uh, 
and as I said, okay, so this sort of strict hierarchy here. So if you have this impossibility result for dynamically available protocols, that then has to hold also for the fully permissionless protocols like Bitcoin. So now let's start looking at how the, the framework actually works. So if we're going to be um, sort of thinking about permissionless protocols, then generally we're going to think about protocols that work relative to what we'll call like resources of some kind. Okay, so resources could be stuff, things like stake, uh, hash rate, uh, memory chips, or whatever, right? Just briefly, though, before we talk about resources, I want to introduce like, a version of the permissionless setting in which we don't yet get to talk about resources. Okay? So to move from the, from the permission setting to the permissionless setting, there are actually three new challenges that we sort of introduce simultaneously. Okay? This may be a slightly confusing thing to do, but that's what, we, well, what happens. Okay, so now we move to a setting in which we have an unknown set of participants, okay? and set of participants is also of unknown size. Okay. We also assume that now that people can be, or players, nodes, whatever you call them, can be active or inactive at different, different time slots. Like I could be active, then inactive, then active again, and so on. Okay, and we also have to consider a third sort of challenge. We have to now have to consider the possibility of civil attacks. Okay, so we introduced these three new challenges simultaneously. Like on a technical level, uh, on a theoretical level, that's a sort of slightly crazy thing to do, right? If you're studying things theoretically, generally you want to introduce one new challenge at a time and see what, what does that change and then you introduce another challenge, a challenge to see what that changes and so on. So here we're introduce, in, introducing uh, three new changes at the same time. And basically, the, the reason is that there's a change in aim, right? So in the permission setting, we're talking about consensus protocols because we want to develop fault tolerance. Now we have this new sort of vaguely defined aim, which is decentralization. And it seems that in order to, uh, to have decentralization, we need to uh, meet these, these three new challenges. OK, so we introduce the three challenges simultaneously. But then when we prove each impossibility result, it's going to be interesting to sort of think about so which of these three new challenges is actually required to give that new impossibility result. Right? So sometimes, well, it, we have to ask, is it the case that all three new challenges are required? Or maybe it's just one new, one, one, one of these, these changes that's driving the new impossibility result. So when you say the aim is now decentralization, do you have a technical definition of what decentralization means, or is it just that? Now, if I had that, I might have led with that, I guess. But no, I guess we're, we're sort of defining permissionlessness and where uh, decentralization is remaining a, a vague term for us. Okay, yeah. okay. okay uh, so generally, I want to keep everything at a fairly high level. I'm not going to go into the sort of technical details of the framework. But just to make things uh, like a little bit more concrete, uh, I'm going <clears> to <throat> make what I've said there slightly more precise. Okay, so I'm just going to say the same thing again, but in slightly more precise language. Okay, so we consider a potentially infinite set of players, P, although we only have a finite number so active each time slot. So we have a potentially infinite number of players, P. Uh, each player is going to be allocated a non-empty and potentially infinite set of identifiers. So the identifiers you can think of being like an un a potentially unbounded list of like public keys, of which P, you know, such that P is aware of the corresponding private keys. Okay, identifier sets are disjoint. We have time divided up into discrete time slots. Okay, time slot one, time slot two, so second. It may be important to emphasize that the protocol can't know any of those things. Right? So the protocol description is independent of script P, is independent right. of the Right, so these are not inputs to the protocol. These, these, unlike these, the permission setting, right. 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 These, these, are just, these are just facts. So in fact, well, that, that will be uh, stated lower down, precisely, yeah. Okay. Okay, so we have the time divided into discrete time slots, time slot one, time slot two, and so on, up to time slot. D, let's say we're calling D the duration. D could be infinite or D could be finite, depending on what you want to consider. OK, then we stipulate. So each player can now be active or inactive at each time slot. If a player is inactive, that means they, they can't send or receive any messages and they carry out no, no activity whatsoever. If they're active, then they can send or receive messages. And if they're honest, they'll carry out you know, the, the, the uh, activity as prescribed by the protocol. OK, then a little bit of uh, terminology. So by a player allocation, we just mean a function specifying the, the identifier set for each player, and the time slots of each player is active. OK, and we assume that the player set and the player allocation are unknown. OK, so the protocol doesn't know that, or the Veriton players, I don't know that. Obviously, each player knows their own identifier set, right? but they don't know the identifier sets of other players. OK, and then just uh, a couple more basic definitions. So by the synchronous setting, we mean a setting in which message delivery is reliable. OK, so there's some known bound delta. So that you will never only send a message uh, at time t, it will always arrive at least by time t plus delta, if not before. 
Okay, and then the, the partially synchronous setting, uh, I'm defining here slightly vaguely, but uh, it's not that difficult to make it precise. Okay, so in the partially synchronous setting, message delivery is sometimes unreliable. You don't know when it's reliable and when it's not. But there are guaranteed to be long periods during which message deliver delivery is reliable in this sense. Okay, and long here means like sufficiently long as long as you need in order to prove the required property. Yep. Okay, so that defines uh, like a version of the permissionless setting in which we don't yet have resources. Okay, it's not that hard to, well, it's, it requires a proof, it's not, it's not entirely trivial, but it's not that hard to see that the, the, the solving consensus isn't possible in this setting. So here's a more formal statement. So we consider the fully permissionless setting without resources yet, and suppose that the player set P is finite. Well, then for every row, no protocol solves by Zanti agreement when up to a row fraction of the play, players may be with Zanti. So for every row greater than zero. Right? So as long as there are some Byzantine players around, consensus is not possible in this setting. So importantly, though, so this result holds even in the synchronous setting, where you have entirely uh, reliable message delivery, okay? even with a known player set, okay? as long as we don't actually know their identifiers, even with a known player set, and with all players active at all time slots. Okay, so it's really it's the, the possibility of civil attacks that drives this impossibility. Okay, it's not, of the three complexities we introduced, it's, it's, a possible, it's only the possibility of civil attacks that's required to get the impossibility here. And in fact, so there, there are some results by uh, Karchandani and Mottenhofer. So they consider a setting in which you have an unknown player set, okay, but where players are always active and there's no possibility of civil attacks, and there they are able to get positive results, okay, consensus is possible. Uh, and equally, if you can have a, like a known player set, you can have no possibility of civil attacks, and it's actually where players can be inactive and active at different time slots, and there again you can get positive results. Okay, so it's really the, it's the possibility of civil attacks that makes uh, consensus impossible here. Okay, so consensus isn't possible in this setting, but then obviously the sort of innovation of the Bitcoin paper is that if we consider some notion of resource like hash rate, yeah, and we restrict the, the resources that the adversary could own, then consensus does, does become possible. Yeah. Okay, so in our uh, framework, we're going to consider resources of two types. Okay? So we have external resources, which you can think of as being things like ASICs or memory chips. Okay? And then we have on-chain resources. Okay? So stake is an example of an on-chain resource, uh, but there exist other forms of on-chain resource, and we'll talk about them later on. Uh, so external on-chain resources have some, some fundamental differences. So first of all, external resources are generally allocated to players, on-chain resources to identifiers. It's also the case that on-chain resources can be selectively confiscated, right? So that, that becomes important when you start thinking about things like slashing. Okay, that becomes important for economic arguments. Uh, and then it's also the case that on-chain resources are user-relative, right? In the sense that different players may see different versions of the blockchain, and so they have different ideas about who owns what. Yeah. Okay, and generally it's also the case that on-chain resources only change with each consensus decision. Okay. Sorry, there are... Yeah. Do you also draw a distinction that like external resources are typically infinite in a sense, or you don't know what the total, you don't know the denominator of them and on yes, chain? Yeah, yeah, so generally when we're dealing with external resources, we'll, we'll assume that you don't know the total hash rate and that kind of thing. Although you, know, you could potentially consider settings where that, it, that is, you do know the total hash rate and see what changes. Okay, our, our, sort of, our, our basic assumption will be you don't know the total hash rate normally. Yeah. And that distinction plays an important role in proofs. Okay, so they have different properties, so we have to model them differently. Uh, so we're going to model external resources using something we'll call permitter oracles, uh, but we won't use oracles to model on-chain resources. Okay. okay, so we've got external resources, on-chain resources. Uh, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to talk about external resources for a bit, then on-chain resources for a bit, and then we'll just start defining the different levels of the hierarchy. Okay, so we're fully permissionless downwards. So at a high level, first of all, okay, so for each external resource, we consider what we call a resource allocation function. Okay, this is a, a simple thing. Resource, resource allocation function just allocates each player some, some balance at each time slot. Okay, so you can just think of each player as having some, some hash rate, if you like, or some memory capacity, or whatever, at each time slot. Okay. okay, and then, so players can send requests to the permitter oracle. Okay, so you can think of a request as being something like a request for a proof of work, something like that. Okay. And then the, the permitted oracle will respond, right, uh, depending on their, their resource balance. So maybe if you've got you know, higher hash rates, you're more likely to get the corresponding the proof of work that you've asked for. Okay, so this is just a very high level level description, first of all. So to make that a little bit more concrete, I'm going to give an example of how we do it for, for Bitcoin's proof of work. Okay, okay so for Bitcoin's proof of work to model that, uh, we'll suppose a request that any player P sends to the permitted oracle at any time slot T. 
has to be a pair of the form B sigma. So here you can think of B as being some hash rate that's dedicated to this request for a proof of work. And sigma is the string uh, that we're asking for a proof of work for. So this could be like a block of transactions or whatever, or a hash of a block of transactions. This R is independent of the consensus. So, yeah, the, the, the resource allocation function R, if I didn't say it already, maybe I, maybe I should have done, is this is uh, sort of under to, uh, unknown to the protocol. Right? So the protocol has to operate essentially for arbitrary R, an unknown R, although there are some small details there, but yes. Yeah. And conversely, the operation of the protocol does not in turn influence script R. Right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Andrew? Hello. Yeah. Um, how do you think about renting hash rate or buying it from the cloud? Say again, sorry? What about a miner that rents the hash rate, buys it from Amazon? Uh, well, yeah, I guess here we're just assuming that everybody has access to a certain hash rate. We're not particularly worried about uh, how they're getting it as a payment. Yeah. There are, there are details that should, extra details that should be included in the model, but I'll be interested to hear it. But I'm, yeah, yeah. At the moment, we're just assuming that everybody has access to a certain hash rate at each time slot. Okay, okay so focusing on Bitcoin. Okay, so we've got, uh, we can send requests to this uh, permitted oracle at each time slot. Each request is a pair of the form B sigma. You can think of B as being the, the hash rate I'm dedicating to the request. Sigma is the thing that I'm asking for a proof of work for. You can make multiple requests so long as you're not reusing hash rate. Okay, so I can make a uh, request B1 sigma 1 up to BK sigma K. Okay, so long as, as I say, we don't reuse hash rates. So interpreting the BIs here as uh, the hash rates devoted, devoted to each of the requests. Okay, they, 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 don't, they don't sum to more than my, my total hash rate at this, at this time slot. Okay, and that's also true for Byzantine pairs. Okay, so those are requests, and then how does the, uh, the permitted oracle respond? Okay, so to integrate with the, the Bitcoin difficulty adjustment algorithm, we want proofs of work to have a certain quality. Okay, so each proof of work oracle response is going to be a 256-bit string tau, and the quality of tau is just the number of zeros that it begins with. Okay, then if P submits the request B sigma at time slot T, okay, then the permitted oracle independently samples B many 256-bit strings, uniformly random, okay, and responds with tau, which is the lexicographically smallest of those. And you can think of the response here as in some sense being sort of signed by the permitter, so these proof of works can't be faked by players. Okay, so that gives us a very simple way of modeling Bitcoin. Obviously, we, we want this to work much more generally. It should work also for like cheers, proof of space, and so on, and you, you, can, you can do these things. Okay. Okay, I want you to so emphasize this point, though. So the on-chain resources don't work like this, in the sense that the state you think I have may, may depend on the version of the blockchain you've seen. Okay, so with the external resources, I always just have, I have a specific amount of hash rate each time slot. Okay, that's a sort of objective fact. Okay, but with stake, it's less objective. It's subjective. Different people have different views of the blockchain. Okay, uh, so that's external resources, now on-chain resources. Uh, in fact though, okay, so stake is one form of on-chain resources. The resource, there are other forms which we'll talk about later on. Uh, for now, just to keep things simple, I'm just gonna focus on stake. Okay, so we'll come to other forms later on. Okay, so we have initial stake distribution. Okay, so, so certain uh, players are allocated non-zero stake at the start, the start of the process. We have transactions being issued by an environment. That's fairly standard, okay. And then uh, we, know we need some way of interpreting the, trans the transactions, okay? So we have what we call a stake allocation function, <clears throat> which given any set of transactions, that determines, that takes that set of transactions and says, well, who owns which stake according to that set of transactions, okay? Okay, and then, so on-chain resources uh, like stake don't generally make much sense outside the context of, of blockchain protocols. So we have to define what we mean by them. Okay, so each blockchain protocol uh, specifies a, a confirmation rule, okay? It's a very simple thing, the confirmation rule, it's just a function that takes any set of messages, including transactions, and returns a, a subset of those messages. Okay, so confirmation rule just takes any set of messages, returns some subset of those. At any given point in time, any time slot, if M is the set of all messages received by a player at a time slot for less to equal C, then P is going to regard the messages in C of M as confirmed. Okay, so it takes all the messages it's received, and some of them are confirmed, and some aren't. So generally here, I'm allowing that you can, you can, you can confirm messages that aren't transactions. Okay, I don't know if the else here is, is quite standard, right? So we, we specify standard notions of liveness and consistency. Okay, so liveness, as I expect people are aware, right? Liveness basically just means that transactions that don't conflict with others eventually become confirmed. Uh, and consistency says that honest players uh, eventually agree on the set of confirmed transactions. Okay, and we don't actually have to set this up so we have a total ordering on transactions here. You can, you can do a, a, it's a, it's a strictly easier task of implementing a payment system. We can, we can consider that as well.
Okay, so just uh, one more uh, brief definition before we start considering the hierarchy. Okay, so we need to define what we mean by like a row bound adversary. Okay, what do we mean by a small, small adversary? So most of this definition is fairly obvious. Okay, so we're going to say, first of all, let's talk about executions. We'll say an execution of the protocol is row bounded for some row in 0, 1. So row might be a third or whatever. If, so first of all, we're going to talk about external resources here. Okay, so first of all, uh, resource allocations corresponding to external resources each allocate the adversary at most a row fraction of the total of the external resources at each time slot. Okay, so we're going to assume the adversary always owns like you know, less than a half of the, the, the hash rate or whatever. Yeah? Okay, so that's quite straightforward. And then for stake, we make the following assumption. So among active players, <coughs> Byzantine players never control more than a row fraction of the stake. Okay, so that might, that's a sort of informal version, so more for, there's, a, there's a more formal version uh, stated uh, there. So formally, for any honest player P, any time slot T, if TR is a set of transactions that are confirmed for P at that, that time slot T in execution, then at most a row fraction of the stake allocated to players active at T by that set of transactions is allocated by Xantine players. Okay, so this might seem like a quite a sort of uh, a natural assumption. Basically, we're saying, okay, look at this set of confirmed transactions. That was always allocate the adversary at most uh, a third of the stake or whatever. Okay. In some sense, that's a, it's a slightly uh, odd definition, though, because it kind of, in some sense, it's, it's, it's a, as much a condition on the protocol as it is on the environment. Right? Why is it reasonable to assume for arbitrary protocols that this is the case? You might have odd protocols that like, purposely try to confirm Byzantine transactions or something like that. Right? Okay. So what we really like is a condition on the, in the environment. Okay, but for now, we're gonna, this is a fairly standard sort of notion that people use. So we're gonna use this notion, and then we're gonna come back later on and consider like, why maybe it's interesting and problematic in various ways. Okay. okay, so for now, though, we're just assuming any sort of confirmed transactions allocates the adversary at like, most a row fraction of the stake, at least at most a third of the stake. Or whatever. Okay, so that was executions. When we, when we say the adversary is row-bounded, we mean that we restrict attention to row-bounded executions. Okay, and then one more easy definition. We say a protocol is row-resilient when it can deal with row-bounded adversaries. Okay, yeah, so row-resilience just means you can deal with row-bounded adversaries. Okay, so that's the, the uh, end of those definitions. And now we can start uh, defining the hierarchy and see what happens at different levels of the hierarchy. Okay, so let's define the fully permissionless setting first, now like with resource restrictions, right? So the fully permissionless setting with resource restrictions is the same as the, the setting we defined earlier on, where we have these three new complexities, like players can be active or inactive, and you have an unknown player set, and we also have to deal with similar attacks, okay? But now we have the following changes, okay? So now protocols can make use of a finite set of external resources and can run relative to an environment that sends transactions, okay? So now we have resources around. Uh, and you're now also allowed to assume that the adversary is row bounded okay, for some row in zero one. Okay, so hopefully that seems sort of reasonably natural. Okay, and then uh, our first main theorem here is, is, is the one that we, we saw earlier on, but now I'm going to state it uh, slightly more precisely. So we consider the fully permissionless and authenticated setting. Okay, so authenticated, authenticated just means we have signature schemes with no PKI. Right? Okay, so consider the fully permissionless and authenticated setting with synchronous communication. Suppose the adversary is row bounded for some row greater than zero. Well, then every deterministic protocol for solving a Byzantine agreement has infinite executions in which honest players never terminate. Okay, so basically, deterministic protocols won't work here. Okay. okay, so I haven't formally defined Byzantine agreement. If you know the Byzantine agreement problem, then good. Otherwise, just replace Byzantine agreement with the word consensus there. Okay, that's fine. Okay. So that's uh, an impossibility result for the uh, fully permissionless setting. OK, so now let's move on to the dynamically available setting. OK, so the, the next level down on the hierarchy, it's like easier setting to operate in. OK, so, <clears throat> so what differentiates a setting in which proof of state protocols are required to operate from the setting in which proof of work protocols are, are normally required to operate? Well, basically, the difference is that we make stronger assumptions about which players should be active. Okay, so if you think about it, with the, with the fully permissionless setting, we kind of allow that the, the mistake hanging around and maybe you know, other forms of one-chain resource that we haven't talked about yet. But in some sense, they're, they're no good so far because there's no reason that anybody who has state should be active. Right? So we can't make use of, of that fact. Okay? So now we need to actually be able to use that assumption. Assume we need something that uh, allows us to assume that those players who own stake are actually going to be active and running the protocol. 
Okay, so, well, there's just a definition of the, this is a rough description of the, of the fully permissionless setting there to con contrast with. Okay, so here's the definition of the dynamically available setting. Okay, <clears throat> so in the, in the DA setting, we suppose that if TR is a set of transactions confirmed for some honest player, at some time slot T, then at least one honest player allocated non-zero stake by that set of transactions is active. Okay, so you look at the players who have stake, at least some of the honest players are turning up. Okay, then normally we'd also add in some sort of round, so row, row, row bounded assumption. Right? So we, if you assume the adversary is row bounded, then we also have that at most a row fraction of active players are Byzantine. Okay, so that's very simple, yeah. Okay, so that's the definition of the DA setting. Uh, here immediately is an impossibility result for the, the DA setting. So dynamically available protocols can't solve probabilistic Byzantine agreement or consensus in the partial symmetry model. Okay. So again, as I said before, like the partial symmetry model is a very standard sort of uh, model in which like most of the standard permission protocols operate. But dynamically available protocols can't solve consensus, like even probabilistically, in that setting. Okay. And again, the way the hierarchy works, the fact that this is an impossible result for the, the DA setting means it's also true of the fully permissionless setting. Okay, so we, uh, we also we saw before that fully permissionless protocols can't be deterministic. Okay, we can conjecture that dynamically available protocols can be, but we haven't written a proof of that down yet. Okay, so that was the DA setting. Now let's move on to the, the next one, the, the quasi permissionless setting. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so again, I said there's stake. There are other forms of on-chain resources. Okay, and we want to define the, the quasi permissionless setting for on-chain resources more generally. But first of all, I'm going to state a, I'm going to state a simplified version just for stake. And then I'll talk about other forms of on-chain resource, and then we'll define the sort of general version. Okay. okay, so this is the, the simplified version just for stake. So in the quasi-permissionless setting, we suppose that if TR is a set of transactions confirmed for some honest player at some time slot, then all honest players allocated non-zero state by the set of transactions are, are active. Okay, so for the, for the DA setting, you look at the, uh, you're, you're, you're expecting that at least some of the honest players are turning up and participating. But in the, in the quasi permissionless setting, we require that they all do. Okay, if, if you know that the way most of these, these protocols, like you know, PBFT, Tendermint, et cetera, operate, or even proof of stake implementations of them, they require this sort of, this sort of condition to operate. Okay? Otherwise, you lose liveness. OK, so that's a simple version just for stake. So now let's talk about uh, other forms of on chain resource. OK, so as I said, the stake is one form of on chain resource. Uh, there are others, so introduce that idea. It's, it's useful to talk about these proof of work protocols of Hybrid, Solida, and Bizcoin. Okay, so they, these are sort of three slightly different protocols, but at a high level, they all operate in a similar sort of way. Okay, so the basic idea is that a proof of work is used to select a rolling sequence of committees. Once a committee is selected, right, imagine you're, you're at a certain point, you've got a certain version of the blockchain, you've got a certain committee who's now like the committee at this point in time, okay, that's fixed for now. Once a committee is selected, they just carry out a, a, like a standard permission protocol in order to implement the next consensus decision. Okay? They're just carrying out a standard permission protocol. That consensus decision has to include like, the, the next sequence of transactions to be committed to the blockchain, right? as well as determining which players have provided sufficient proof of work in the meantime for inclusion in the next committee. Okay? So we have one version of the committee. They run a standard permission protocol that determines, okay, what's the next sequence of transactions, who's provided enough proof of work to be in the next committee, and now we've got our next committee. Okay? They, they, they then carry out the, uh, the next consensus decision and so on. Yeah. So in that, in that context, I'm going to say the, the, the on-chain record that P is a member of the present committee should be seen as an on-chain resource, right? Because that, that resource allows P, allows that, that player to participate in the, in, the, in the protocol. It could potentially earn rewards, it could be transferable and so on. So as well that these protocols operate in some version of uh, like the, the quasi permissionless setting that we previously just defined for stake, basically, right? Because all honest players with on-chain resources are required to be active, otherwise the protocol will stall. Right? Because basically the, the, the players in the committee are going to carry out a standard permission protocol, and the way those protocols work is you require all honest players to be active, otherwise they, they don't have liveness. Okay, so those, those protocols operate in at least some version of the, the QP setting. Okay, so to define a general version of the quasi permission setting, we're going to allow protocols to define arbitrary on-chain resources. So that's quite simple. We could say so a protocol defined resource is just a function that takes any set of messages and allocates each player some, some balance. And that's all that says there. Okay, it just takes any, any, any set of messages and allocates each player a particular balance. 
So those are protocol defined resources, and by an on chain resource, we mean a resource that's either stake or protocol defined. So then, yeah, so the, the general version of the QP setting, I'm stating it, stating it slightly informally here, but it's <coughs> easy to make formal. So protocol, in, in the quasi permissionless setting, protocols are allowed to specify a set of on-chain resources, S1 star up to SK star, and any one of these could be stake, or maybe none of them are stake, or whatever. <coughs> and by definition, an execution of the protocol is consistent with the quasi permissionless setting. If one of these players are active whenever they own on-chain resources. Okay, so then we have uh, immediately to, to compare with the other settings, we have a, a nice positive result for the QP setting. So for row less than a third, there exist row resilient and deterministic proof of state protocols that are live and consistent in the partial symphony model. Okay. So that immediately separates uh, what's possible in the QP and the DA settings and in the fully permissionless as well. You could also, it's interesting, another, another thing that sort of separates what's possible, in the set, what's possible in different settings is accountability. So I'm not going to sort of go into accountability in, in any detail, but people are probably have some awareness. So the basic idea is that a, a protocol is accountable if uh, it has this kind of property that Ethereum has, that if there is a consistency violation, then the, pro the protocol produces pr proof of guilt for a, a significant fraction of the parties. Yeah. Okay, so there's there. So protocols operating in the QP setting can be accountable, whereas Nosret and others have shown that uh, protocols operating in the dynamically available setting can't be accountable. Another interesting separation. Okay, so to finish then, I just want to sort of re-examine a little bit the assumptions that we made here, going back to the sort of comment that I made earlier on. Okay, so in order to prove this theorem here, we've assumed, I can talk about that we've assumed that the adversary was row bounded. Right? And as I said before, there's some some sort of aspects of that definition that might seem a little bit uh, suspect. Actually, Andy, can we rewind a second? I mean, this theorem resembles statements that are made for very major layer one blockchain protocols yeah. that people are aware of. So it's maybe just worth saying a little bit about okay, that. Okay, so yeah, so this, this I guess, is, is generally understood as people, people in the community sort of think of this as being uh, true. If you actually look for a formal proof of it, there, there isn't any uh, in existence, or well, at least none that we can find prior to writing one up. Okay, so we've written up a formal proof of this fact. And it's. Uh, Surprisingly, much more complicated than you might think it is. Okay, so moving from the, the case of the permission protocols to the proof of stake implementation has a lot of difficulties, a lot of, a lot of complexities. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to check out the proof, uh, but it's, it's quite it's quite a complicated. So for example, even though the protocol is based on tendermint, somehow the f liveness and consistency for the proof of stake extension seems to get quite a bit more complex. Quite a little bit more, yeah. This is based, deal, dealing with the the, the Changing player sets is complicated in ways that may not immediately be obvious. Yeah. For this theorem, uh, yeah, we have made this assumption that the adversary is row-bounded. Okay? So I want to remind ourselves what that definition was. So first of all, there were sort of two parts to that definition. Part of it was kind of entirely natural. Right? First of all, for external resources, it's, it's fairly straightforward. You just say, okay, obviously, the adversary will own you know, less than a third of the hash rate or whatever each time slot. For stake, it was slightly uh, a little bit more... Uh, Interesting. So among, for stake, we basically assumed that whenever you look at any confirmed set of transactions, that confirmed set of transactions always allocates the adversary and most of row fraction of the stake. And the basic objection is, well, okay, so why is it reasonable to assume that's the case, right? That seems as much an assumption that on the protocol as it is on the, the execution issuing the instructions. Okay. So I want to sort of dig down on that a little bit. And to do that, I want to start off by thinking about whether or not uh, proof of work protocols can be live and consistent in the partial synchrony model. Okay, that might seem like a slightly odd thing to do. I think it shed some light. Okay, so in particular, I want to think about what goes wrong with the Bitcoin. Okay, uh, so I, I described Bitcoin at a high level before. Well, to, again, just to remind you, what goes wrong with Bitcoin if we try and operate it in the partial synchrony model? Okay, so that, to remind you how the protocol works. So we start off with a genesis block that specifies an initial committee. Now, okay, so that's, that's not normal for proof of work protocols. Okay, but we're, that's, what, that's what we have with proof of state protocols, right? We have initial distribution. Now let's imagine we have an initial distribution, okay? Even though we're working with a proof of work protocol. Okay, and let's suppose that once a committee is selected, they then just carry out this permission protocol. I'm just rem reminding you how things worked before. I said this a few minutes ago. Right, so once a committee is selected, they, they carry out a permission protocol to execute the next consensus decision. Okay, that consensus decision includes like the next sequence of transactions to be committed to the blockchain as well as determining which players are provided sufficient proof of work in the meantime for inclusion in the next committee. So why doesn't that work if we try and uh, operate it in the partial synchrony model? 
There's no problem with the permission protocol, right? Because permission protocols can definitely operate in partial synchrony, right? They, they can be designed so that they, they work perfectly well. They're live and consistent in partial synchrony. So we start off with our committee. We're doing a, a permission protocol, which we know will function. Then we have our next committee, and they're just going to do the same again. So what's the problem? So the problem is that the proof of work produced by honest players might not, not, make, its work, not make its way to the committee, right? So the committee that is sitting there uh, executing the next consensus decision, they're looking to see, so what proof of work has come in? But during a network partition, we, we might only hear proof of work provided by the Byzantine players. Yeah. So during a network partition, we might end up with uh, the next committee being entirely Byzantine, right? Because we've only heard proof of work from the Byzantine players. So the next question is, okay, can something similar to that happen with proof of stake? Do you, do you need Byzantine players? Can't you just have a classic network partition and two parts of the network that just work in parallel? Well, the, the, the problem here is that we, we, we're going to end up with a Byzantine majority, right? If, if, if there are no Byzantine players, then it, it's, it's going to be fine. The, the problem is, if we don't hear about proof of work from the honest players, so we get a, a, the new committee is formed by Byzantine players, and then the Byzantine players are carried, have taken over the network. Yeah? I, I'm, I'm thinking of a, an impossibility without any, anybody being Byzantine. Just do a partition of the network where there's two different committees that form and make progress without hearing of each other. Uh, yeah, okay. May, I, I, okay. I'd have to think about it. Okay. Okay. The, the main point is it, it doesn't work. Whether we require, require Byzantine players or not, I think, I think we do, but I'd have to think through the details. Okay. Okay. So, Proof of work, it won't work. Let's look at uh, proof of stake. We we're asking, can some, something similar happen with proof of stake? Okay. And the answer is yes. Okay. So why is that? Okay. So I want you to consider an uh, example, which is called like, the payment circle example. Okay. So here we have uh, a set of n players. We're going to imagine that P0, just one of the players is Byzantine. Let's call that P0. Okay. Everybody else is honest, and each player has one unit of stake. And we're going to imagine that, in, that we're going to have n uh, consecutive rounds in which payments will be made. Okay, so in the n consecutive rounds, each player PI authorizes a, a new transfer of a single unit of stake to the, ne the next player in the circle, if you like. Okay, so in each round of transactions, so player, player, each player transfers one unit of stake to the next. So each round of transactions changes nothing. Right? Okay, so we've got n rounds of transactions. There are n transactions in each round. So we have a total of n squared transactions there. Okay, obviously each round of transactions here uh, leaves things unchanged. So at the end of the, the, the story, right, when we look at the total set of all T transactions, the Byzantine player P0 still only has one over N at the total stake. Yeah, and he still only has one, one unit of stake. Okay, now though, what we want to do is to choose a particularly problematic subset of that set of transactions. Okay, so now we're going to choose T prime, a subset of T, to contain the first I transactions issued by player PI. Okay. So if you think about things, in the, let's, let's be precise, let's imagine we're in the UTXO model. So that, that will then be a, a valid set of transactions. Okay, if you think that through, that we end up now with P0, uh, P0 the, the, single, the Byzantine player, owning all the stake. Okay, so we have a set of transactions, T, which allocates the Byzantine player one over N of the stake. We pull out the right subset, and we're going to allocate the Byzantine player all the stake. Okay, so... The same sort of thing happens in a proof of state protocol, or can happen as in the proof of work example I gave before. Right, if we're doing a network partition, we've got a certain set of confirmed transactions. The, the set of all transactions out there might allocate the Byzantine players a, a small proportion of the, of the stake. If we, if we see the, the wrong uh, subset of those transactions, then we'll end up uh, confirming dishonest majorities. OK, so this theorem, which I'm stating just in rough form, uh, says a sort of uh, more precise version of that. So if we drop the assumption that the adversary is row-bound and assume instead that only uh, the set of all transactions issued by the environment allocates the adversary most of row facts in the stake, so we, look, we just look at all the transactions issued by the environment instead here. Yeah? Okay. Then proof-of-state protocols can't be row-resilient row in the partial synchrony model for any row greater than zero. OK, so that sounds sort of bad. But then we can save it. Uh, so basically, what, what was the issue here? The issue was that we had these sort of long nested sequences of transactions, and the honest players were issuing transactions that relied on others before those previous transactions are confirmed. Okay, so if we restrict to a scenario where honest players don't do that, then, then we, can, uh, we can save things and we can have proof of state protocols that work in the partial synchrony model. Okay, so this stops being an issue in the UTXO model 
Uh, at least in the UTX model. If no honest player issues any transaction TR until all transactions required for TR to be valid are already confirmed. Okay, so I'll stop there. Right, thanks for listening. Yeah. I would like to ask about the conjecture regarding the that dynamically available protocols could be deterministic. Mm, yeah. I was I was inclining more towards the other conjecture that uh, they cannot be deterministic. Mm. I mean, there are uh, dynamically available protocols um, that are deterministic except the leader selection part, but the leader selection part still requires a VRF in those cases. So. I feel like the arguments that you could you use for the uh, fully permissionless one can apply almost like so okay, to the dynamically ex available. Extending the proof to the dynamically available setting, I don't see how to do. And okay, my, my answer there, which is not entirely strong, is I, I have in mind certain protocols that are actually leaderless protocols or DAG based protocols, which I think will work. But I, I haven't written down the proof, and so I, if I try writing down the proof, of course, you can always come across difficulties, right? But uh, yeah, I have in mind protocols, a, a protocol that I. I think will work, yeah. but could turn out to be wrong. So conjecture, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. What's your favorite open question? Uh, gosh, favorite open question. Uh, well, okay, that one's okay. I guess that would uh, give us a nice formal separation between the, the FB setting and the, and the DA setting. Uh, yes, are there maybe questions around uh, accountability? I don't know. Are there pr proof of work for protocols can become accountable if you work in the QP setting and that kind of thing? Um, okay. Yeah. So you talked about how accountability is not possible in the DA setting, but yeah. it is possible in the quasi permissionless. Yeah. Have you like thought about other properties that are possible in one setting but not in another setting? Basically? Well, it gave you uh, a bunch of different examples there, right? So we had we had three at least there. So we had the deterministic. You, you can't be deterministic in the, in the FP setting, and you can in the quasi-permissionless setting, maybe in the DA setting. Also, you can, you can be live and consistent in partial synchrony in the QP setting and not in the DA setting. Uh, so accountability is a, is a third one there, but yeah, it'd be interesting to extend that list. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the, the, sort of the general conjecture is a lot of the time the impossibility and possibility results are driven as much by the sort of setting you're operating in uh, as, as whether you're on like a proof of work or a proof of state protocol, for example. Looks like responsiveness would be one of those properties. You think that's, yeah? So uh, expand on that? So. Because like the quasi-permissionless ones, because they can operate under partial synchrony, they could perhaps all be responsive, whereas the dynamically available ones require synchrony, so I would doubt if they could be responsive. I think you might be right about that, yeah. yeah. So being responsive uh, in synchrony is fairly, fairly similar to just being live and consistent in partial synchrony. So I think that's a good conjecture. Yes, OK, let's look at that later this week then. OK, any other questions? What are your thoughts on, uh, I mean, you know, so sort of there's this FLP analogy, right, to the mm. fully permissionless impossibility result in synchrony versus sort of FLP asynchronous permissioned. Is, what are your thoughts on, like, any possible connection between the two models? Uh, I guess. Okay, a basic observation there is that there is a big similarity to, between the proofs. Right? Both proofs have this basic, say, the same basic form. It's a bivalency proof where you start off in a bivalent position and you extend one at a time. Uh, so there's, I guess there's obviously some sort of connection there. But okay, I guess, yes, we need to think deeper about whether that analogy goes deeper. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm.